Welcome on board for a journey full of beauty and nostalgia. A chance to sit back and soak up the views as we go in search of long lost railways and the way of life that went with them. From the narrow gauge railways of North Wales to the secrets of Queen Victoria's long lost railway near Balmoral. We'll travel by train to the most spectacular scenery the British Isles has to offer. So sit back and enjoy Britain's most beautiful lost railways. It was only 180 years ago that Britain invented railways as we know them. It was an innovation that would have a huge impact on so many aspects of people's lives, not just in this country, but throughout the world. In the next hour, we're heading back to where it all started, the north of England. We're in the County Durham countryside to uncover remnants of the earliest railroads that were defunct long before the invention of the steam locomotive. And we're digging around Darlington to uncover traces of the world's first public railway in the most unexpected places. We'll be taking a steam hauled special through the spectacular scenery of the North Yorkshire Moors on one of Britain's earliest railways that was lost in the 1960s, but has been brought back to life as a heritage line. And visiting the beautiful city of York to search out its lost railway treasures. Exploring in the undergrowth the remains of a gorgeous garden railway that started out as a rich man's toy and became a lifeline for a tiny village community. But first, exactly where did the whole idea of railways come from? The railway revolution that began in Britain in the early 19th century would eventually transform the lives of people in every corner of the world. But the principle of running wheels on tracks to reduce friction and to basically stop them from sinking into the mud was tried way back in history. The ancient Greeks are thought to have invented the basic idea, the Romans to have brought the concept to England. But the first real evidence of rail tracks here is in old mines in the Lakeland Hills, dating back to Elizabethan times. But it was in the coalfields of northeast England where the idea really took off. Wagonways were developed to carry coal from mines down to rivers for loading onto ships. The pulling power came from horses, unless the wagons were rolling down hills. And the wooden tracks were often nothing more than planks laid in a field. But demand for coal increased and the wagonways linked up to form a network. This impressive arch at Tanfield in County Durham is the world's oldest surviving railway bridge, built around 1725 for a long lost horse drawn wagonway. That bridge was the biggest thing in the northeast since the Roman Wall or Durham Cathedral. And of course, if you look at it, it uses the same technology. It's Roman arches, it's Norman arches. Nothing terribly radical about it, except that it's enormous size. As wagonway traffic grew, the whole system became entirely dependent on horsepower, and the Napoleonic Wars caused a crisis. The price of horse food went up. Lots of horses were going off to be shot or whatever by Napoleon. Horses were suddenly a rare commodity. And all at once, all of the colliery owners realized they had a supply problem on their hands. And almost without exception, they started experimenting with their local inventor, their local genius, their preferred bidder, whatever you want to call it, to experiment with, to try and build a horse that ate coal, to try and invent an early steam locomotive. Stationary steam engines have been pumping flood water from the bottom of mine shafts 
but now the race was on to get steam power on the move. A replica of a very early colliery engine, Puffing Billy, is in operation at Beamish Museum in County Durham. The first locomotives that really took off in the northeast were really in the 1810, 11, through to about 1815. And that is a very, very neck and neck development where people retrospectively claim that they were the first, or no, he was the first, I was the first. But there at Wylam, Bottle and Chapman with their locomotives at Hetton. Stevenson was slightly later with his first locomotive in 1814. But they all copied each other's ideas so intensely and intently that it's very hard now sometimes to work out who really invented which bit. The coal owners were actually competing with each other. They were investing in a new technology that they knew eventually would pay off but in the short term, it probably had little economic impact. Certainly, the unreliability of some of them was so comical that at least the engines at Wylam were initially sent out with a set of horses to bring them back when they failed. As the Industrial Revolution got into gear, there was undoubtedly demand for better transport. In many places, the turnpike toll roads that had existed since the early 1700s amounted to nothing more than dirt tracks. The canals that had made huge improvements to transportation of raw materials were owned and run by powerful companies who had something of a monopoly. They were often expensive, slow and unreliable. Many ran dry in the summer and froze over in the winter. But it was the steam locomotives being developed in the coal fields that brought the prospect of massive change. One of the many engineers who experimented with steam locos in the northeast coal fields was George Stevenson. Born in Wylam in Northumberland, he taught himself to read at the age of 18. Although he may not have invented the steam locomotive, George Stevenson was undoubtedly the man who saw its massive potential beyond the coal fields. He was instrumental in persuading the businessmen of Darlington to build the world's first public railway. The Stockton to Darlington Railway grabbed worldwide attention when it opened on September the 27th, 1825. The opening day was declared a local holiday, but the world's first public railway hadn't been universally welcomed. There was certainly opposition and there was a great amount of trepidation because many people felt that, you know, God did not ex intend us to go faster than a horse. And if we travelled at speeds faster than a horse, we might, for example, instantaneously combust. People were a little bit nervous about the whole thing. And you have to remember that this great mechanical object, belching out fire, smoke, steam, and making a hell of a noise, was something they'd never seen the likes of before. So understandably, well, it was a bit scary fine. The opening day was quite a cause for local celebration because uh, from the picture you can see huge numbers of people crowding the fields around the railway line and around the river. The picture shows the initial train hauled by locomotion going across the Skern River Bridge built in 1825 and incidentally still in use today taking trains from Darlington to Bishop Auckland. You had locomotion at the front of the train uh, going at a speed of probably 8 to 12 miles an hour, which was pretty fast, and a, a whole line of wagons behind it full of interested parties and probably the workers who helped to build the line as well. And in the centre of the train there was the VIP coach called the Experiment, which by modern standards wouldn't have been regarded as really very VIP accommodation. It was probably like a garden shed with a wheel at each corner. Uh, but this was the coach for the great and the good. The rest of the train uh, was made up of ordinary coal wagons but filled with people. What happened in Darlington on that day really shaped the course of the remainder of the 19th and the 20th century, not only in the northeast of England with the building of railways, but all over Great Britain. George Stevenson put on a show, driving his locomotion number one ahead of 500 general passengers and 18 VIPs at a dizzying top speed of 15 miles per hour. 
example, if you look at the uh, early locomotives that he constructed, uh, locomotion, the one that was uh, in use from 1825 on the Stockton and Darlington line, uh, it's got vertical cylinders and it's very reminiscent of the, the vertical beam engines used for pumping water out of mines. So uh, in a way it's a bit like a mechanical grasshopper when you look at it. It's hard to believe that many features of the original Stockton to Darlington Railway are still in use today, or can be discovered with a little digging. The old North Road station in Darlington is now the town's railway museum, and home for an exhibition called Head of Steam. In 1842, when you had the opening of the North-South Railway link between York and Newcastle, this station here at North Road was built uh, for the Stockton and Darlington Railway so that it had a much more prestigious building for its passengers who were intending to travel on the line. So, I mean, this building here dates initially from 1842, and um, I like to think it's probably the oldest working passenger station uh, in Great Britain, if not in the world, uh, because it still has got one platform which is in use by daily trains going from Darlington to Bishop Auckland. It's not just a museum, it is still partly a working station. In this museum, you've got locomotion itself, uh, which is the real thing. It is not plastic, it is not a reproduction, it is the real thing. And you've got examples of other locomotives that were built in Darlington, because you have to remember that Darlington became a very big centre for railway engineering, and the railway engineering provided a huge number of jobs for people in the town. <music> The Skern River Bridge that featured so prominently in the painting of the opening day became more familiar in recent times when it appeared in the nation's wallets. Some of you might remember it featured a few years ago on the back of a five pound note and it still is in use today but when you compare its current surroundings to the surroundings as depicted on the famous picture by John Dobbin, you will see just how much industry has encroached on the rural scene that Dobbin depicted way back in 1825. But yeah, the bridge is still there and it is still in use. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to access and very difficult to get a good photograph of, but uh, you know, with a bit of perseverance you can get something. It's hard to believe that this unassuming pedestrian subway under Darlington's Ring Road was a feature of the world's first railway. When it was built in 1824, the embankment carried the rail track, not a road, and the hole cut through it was a cow tunnel. The cow tunnel, um, well basically it's a tunnel for cows, um, because the line went through the open countryside. It cut fields or farmers' properties uh, in two, and uh, they needed to be able to get their animals uh, from one side uh, of the railway line to the other. Initially, when you approach the old cow tunnel, you're not aware that it is old, because each end of it is faced with modern brick, and it just looks like a standard pedestrian subway under a fairly heavily trafficked road. But when you get to the middle of the cow tunnel, you can see that there are some old stone arches in the centre. The old stones are there. If you go beyond the initial modern brickwork, you find the original old stones uh, in the centre of the cow tunnel. The current Hyington station, just outside Darlington, replaced the original one, just over the level crossing, which is now a public house. It also has a historical claim to fame. This is where locomotion made its first public appearance on the S&D tracks. Locomotion was built in the Stevenson workshops up in Newcastle and was, believe it or not, was brought down by horse and cart uh, over the rutted roads uh, of County Durham and placed on the tracks in Highington. And Highington station, the original station, you can still see it, with the very low platform and the original station buildings which are now used as a pub. While much of the original route of the Stockton and Darlington Railway is still in use, one lost section used to cross what's now the East Coast Main Line. British Rail put up a sign to commemorate the point where the two lines intersected. But passing on a speeding train, you need to be very quick to see it. Although undoubtedly groundbreaking, the Stockton to Darlington Railway was in many ways a logical extension of the coalfield wagonways, built to transport coal and still using horses. 
But five years later, a new line took railway development a huge step forward. It linked the two boom towns of the day, Liverpool, whose docks were importing vast amounts of raw materials, and Manchester, 33 miles away, whose mills and factories had become the centre of the UK's cotton trade. The promoters of the new railway were mainly Liverpool merchants, fed up with powerful canal companies charging too much and taking too long to transport goods between the two cities. It was sometimes taking as long to get uh, your goods from Liverpool to Manchester as it was to get the goods from America to Liverpool. And so the merchants of respective cities got together and said, this is madness, and made a proposal to Parliament that an iron road should be built between the two, not an iron railway. They enlisted the help of George Stevenson to draw up a plan which was put to Parliament, but it met with huge opposition. Many of people who owned the land that the canals and the railways ran across obviously were landowners who were probably politicians as well and wanted nothing to do with the railway. The original route, which was proposed by George Stevenson, was rubbished in Parliament and shown to actually be technically deficient. And so Parliament threw out uh, and dismissed the very first proposal, uh, the proposed route, for the Liverpool-Manchester Railway. There was opposition, but it, by and large it was related to the fact that of the route being taken, not necessarily to the principle of building a brand new railway. And everybody began to recognise actually this was going to be groundbreaking stuff and the world would not be the same after this place opened. A second route was approved by Parliament. The next hurdle was to decide whether it was to have trains pulled by horses or steam. So in 1829, the railway invited local inventors to enter their contraptions into trials, run on a completed section of track at Rainhill near Liverpool. The event caught the imagination of the public and became known as the Rainhill Trials. Let's not forget, your average speed for a locomotive hauling coal up to this point was probably about four or five miles an hour tops on the Stockton Darlington, for example. Um, here, the proposal was to run at 30 miles an hour. That is a big increase. Faster than a galloping horse. The first time an engine's gone faster than a galloping horse, people said that actually a human couldn't withstand that velocity, that the air would be sucked out of your lungs. Well, we obviously know different. It's estimated that 15,000 people attended the opening day. The Times reported, Never, perhaps, on any previous occasion were so many scientific gentlemen and practical engineers collected together at one spot as there were on the railroad yesterday. The opposition at the Renault trials to Stevenson was pretty weak, really. Um, you know, one guy turned up with a, a horse on some sort of treadmill, which was clearly against the rules because it had said that, uh, you know, it had to be operated by steam locomotives. But I think it was a bit of uh, PR puff by the organisers, and he was eliminated. And then there was a couple of uh, engines which were called neat little engines in the press um, but you know one of them blew up quite quickly because uh, um, the boiler failed um, and another one broke down after two or three runs uh, so really Stevenson you know had a, a clear run Towards the end of the day, he began to show off by opening up the regulator, going at 30 miles an hour along this uh, uh, piece of track and really showing that, you know, nothing else was in his class at all. And he got the contract to build uh, the locomotives for the railway, which kind of was always going to happen anyway. The original rocket is in the Science Museum in London and there's a replica in the National Railway Museum in York. This tiny, iconic locomotive ensured that the Liverpool to Manchester would be an all-steam railway, and thousands flocked to the opening ceremony on September the 15th, 1830. If you're living in Manchester or Liverpool, either at the Liverpool end waiting for the first train to set off, uh, or at the Manchester end, obviously, waiting to see it arrive, this was akin to someone being allowed to stand at Cape Canaveral and watch the very first ever space shuttle take off. It was that significant. The VIP guests included the Prime Minister, the Duke of Wellington, and former Cabinet member and Liverpool MP, William Huskisson. 
The two had political disagreements, and tragically, Huskisson picked the wrong moment to try and patch things up. Well, Huskisson had had one or two recent political spats with the Duke of Wellington and was actually travelling in a separate carriage to the Duke. And uh, when the locomotives paused for water, he famously got out of the train. He approached the Duke's train. The Duke was sat in his carriage and stood close to him and opened a conversation. At which point the cry went up, stand back. Rocket comes along at high speed and people jump out of the way. Huskisson makes a dash to try and hold on to the side of the coach that the Duke of Wellington's in, loses his footing, falls back, and the engine runs over his thigh, nearly severing it, doesn't kill him outright. Um, he is then obviously in, in, in mortal danger and is placed on the footplate, and George Stevenson personally drives him at what then was very high speed to a cottage along the line where medical assistance was summoned and he died that night. Huskisson's inauspicious death may have cast a shadow over the opening day but appears to have had no impact on the railway being an immediate success. Conceived to carry freight, it was a surprise hit with passengers and in the year after it opened, carried just short of half a million passengers. Reassured by doctors that looking at passing scenery while travelling at 17 miles per hour, the official line speed, wouldn't damage their eyes. The line included some notable engineering achievements. On the climb out of Liverpool, the railway went through the Edge Hill Tunnel, the first railway tunnel dug under a major city, and also resulted in the first recorded death of a navvy. As the Liverpool Mercury recorded, the poor fellow was in the act of undermining a heavy head of clay, 14 or 15 feet high, when the mass fell upon him and crushed his bowels out of his body. When it opened, the tunnel became a tourist attraction. Thousands of visitors were charged a shilling a head, and the proceeds used to support the families of other labourers injured during the construction of the line. Towards Manchester, George Stevenson was faced with no less a challenge than taking his railway across a very deep bog. Here was a challenge that everyone said could never be met. The problem was that the engineer never thought that way and they laid cotton bales, matting, and they continued to lay layers on the moss which sank and sank and sank. And it was probably an act of faith as to whether or not it would just continue to sink forever and therefore the money had run out and the railway would never get built. And eventually it settled and there was a firm bed and of course the railway still runs over Chat Moss today. And closer to Manchester, the Sankey Viaduct was also an engineering marvel. Well, of course, bridge building was nothing new to the railway, but of course Sankey Viaduct was of a scale and a beauty and of course took over the railway river. Uh, but bridges have been built, arches, but this was, it was the scale of it. And of course, again, testament to the engineering quality of the day, that bridge is still in use today, carrying railways, as is the bridge at this museum, which brings uh, trains into the site over the River Railwell, still doing the job that it was built for even today. Although much of the world's first intercity railway is still in use, the original terminus at the Manchester end has been lost, to modern rail travellers at least but the historic buildings are preserved as part of Manchester's Museum of Science and Industry. Those arriving at the world's first purpose-built passenger station in Liverpool Road with first-class tickets would enter through this door, which led up to their own ticket hall and a large waiting room on the first floor close to the platforms. Second-class passengers had a less ornate entrance only yards down the road and although there were far more of them, had a waiting area half the size of those travelling first. The station master's house to the left of the station belonged to the owner of a dye factory. It was an open countryside before the railway arrived. When it came to boarding trains, the platform was at ground level. This early in rail travel, no one had thought to raise platforms to avoid passengers having to climb up into the trains. Directly opposite the passenger station is the world's first railway warehouse. 
All the goods that came into Manchester from Liverpool went into this building on the trackside, mainly cotton, but also tobacco and alcohol. Carriages were turned on small turntables and taken into the building itself. Goods outwards was on the other side of the building, where pulleys lowered cargo down onto carts. The Liverpool and Manchester showed that a railway was feasible, that it wasn't just a way of carrying coal to the river. It was a multi-purpose invention that could be used for uh, carrying passengers, for carrying goods, for carrying mail order. It opened up the way. And it's no surprise, therefore, that within a few years of the Liverpool and Manchester, we get London and Birmingham, we get uh, uh, Birmingham to Manchester. We, we're getting the beginnings of a uh, national network opening up. It was the crucial uh, phase of the development of the railways. So by 1830, the idea of railways had very quickly proved itself, and soon, every town wanted one. We're travelling to the other side of the country, to the North Yorkshire coast, to see how one isolated community became one of the first to adopt this exciting new form of transport. Whitby couldn't have been more different from the boom towns of Liverpool and Manchester, whose traditional industries of shipbuilding and whaling were in trouble. It was geographically isolated. For centuries, its best connection with the rest of the country was by sea. A single turnpike road across the North Yorkshire moors had been built only 80 years earlier, and that still involved a journey that was hazardous at the best of times and often impossible in winter. The town's businessmen knew Whitby's survival depended on creating better links with the outside world. They'd considered a canal across the moors, but having seen what happened in Stockton and Darlington and Liverpool to Manchester, they asked George Stevenson to build them a railway. The initial plan was to build a 23-mile track from Whitby across the inhospitable moors to the market town of Pickering. It was a very ambitious scheme. Uh, you'd still got the, the barrier of the North York Moors. You'd got to find a way of getting over the moors. Uh, and what was decided was, and this was on uh, Stevenson's recommendation, was that the line would come along the valley of the River Esk uh, until it got to a place called Beck Hole, which is a couple of miles from where we are here. Uh, and then the line would climb up a very, very steep incline into the moors, uh, and trains would be hauled up and down this incline by ropes. And that was the way the railway was built. Uh, but initially, apart from the bit where they were hauled up the incline by ropes, the rest of it was horse-drawn. So even though George Stevenson had used steam locomotives on his earlier railways, here he was hedging his bets. Perhaps he thought horses would be more reliable in this difficult terrain. The trains had to go through this little bit of land uh, near the station we're at here at Gromont called Lease Rig full of minerals, incidentally. That was one of the attractions of the railway, of course. It was going to open up all the mineral deposits in the area. Uh, and they, they tunnelled through there, and you can see the tunnel to this day. Uh, and that was used just as a single-track tunnel by the horse trains initially. And you can walk through it to get to our engine sheds today. It's interesting to note just how early it was. It was about the sixth passenger railway in England, was the Whitby and Pickering, so it was very early days. 1838 posters reveal fascinating details about this long-lost horse-drawn railway. To help punctuality, the station doors were closed five minutes before departure, and no one was allowed through unless they'd booked. Passengers who were too late to take their seats had just a day to claim back half the fare. The railway had charges for excess baggage, a ban on tipping the guard, coachman and porter, or any other servant of the railway. Smoking was banned inside first-class carriages, where the fare was three shillings and sixpence. It was a shilling cheaper to ride on top. But there's no doubt that this early horse-drawn railway through some of the most remote countryside in northern England transformed travel. A sea captain arrived at 
at uh, Whitby and there were instructions for him to get across to Liverpool to, 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 to take charge as master of another ship. And now normally this was a journey that would have taken many, many days by stagecoach, but he was able to get the, the Whitby and Pickering Railway, it was still horse-drawn in those days, so that got into Pickering, then he got the stagecoach from there to York, and they were in the, st in the stages of building a railway by then across the Pennines from York. Uh, so by a combination of bits of railway line uh, and bits of stagecoach, he was able to get to Liverpool in about a day, which was taken many, many days off the journey, so an early demonstration of the value of railways. In later years, as we'll see, this innovative railway across the moors will become a victim of the beaching axe in the 1960s. But today, this once lost railway is thriving, and in recent years, it's become possible to complete the entire journey from Whitby to Pickering, hauled by steam. Today, Whitby's booming again as a tourist destination, and a nostalgic ride through the spectacular scenery of the North Yorkshire Moors is a must for many visitors. We're going to travel the length of the original Whitby to Pickering Railway, on trains operated by the North Yorkshire Moors Heritage Railway. Departing from Whitby, the track heads inland, following the gentle curve of the River Esk. Within a few minutes, today's trains pass beneath a spectacular piece of railway architecture, the Larpool Viaduct. It was opened in 1885 to carry the Whitby to Scarborough railway line, 120 feet above the river. This photograph by Victorian photographer Frank Meadow Sutcliffe shows the viaduct under construction. Gangs of navvies used over five million bricks to create its 13 slender arches and a total span of over 900 feet. Their approach to health and safety is long lost, as is the railway line it used to carry. The coastal line closed in 1965, but the viaduct survives to carry a cycle track and is a testament to the Victorian engineers who designed and built it. The first leg of our journey is on the Esk Valley Line, network rail's scenic route from Whitby inland to Middlesbrough. The North Yorkshire Moors Railway has only recently started running steam services alongside the normal diesel commuter trains that use this track. At the village of Gromont, our train branches off onto the preserved railway. When the horse-drawn railway first arrived in Gromont, it completely transformed the settlement. Initially, of course, it was just a staging post on the railway, uh, and uh, there was a little community grew up that was known as Tunnel, after the tunnel. It's our main operating base. We've got our engine sheds here at Gromont, just south of the tunnel, where we do major repairs on engines. The sort of thing that used to get done in Doncaster Works or at Swindon. Now we do all that here at Gromont with a, quite a small number of people. So it's a very interesting village. It's got a lot of history associated with it, a lot of industrial interests here in the past. You'd be surprised, standing where we are now, that only about uh, two or three hundred yards from here, there were blast furnaces, vast blast furnaces, now covered in trees with the North York Moors National Park car park. Uh, so things have changed a little bit, but uh, it was at one time uh, very much a hive of industry with ironstone being mined uh, and various other sorts of minerals being exploited. In 1845, the Whitby to Pickering Railway became part of the York and North Midland Railway, which introduced steam locomotives. The track was doubled and a much larger tunnel was built, right next to the old tunnel for horse-drawn trains. Mm -hmm. 
Even under steam power, the rope hauled incline survived for a while, but eventually, with the Northeastern Railway in charge, it was closed down and the line diverted to avoid the steep gradient. This involved building 11 bridges and a new station, Gulfland Mill. It's still a steep climb into the station, now known simply as Gulfland. It really is the typical rural station. Uh, it's recreated in the period of just after the First World War, the North Eastern Railway. Uh, each of our stations has a different period, and, and this is about 1922 at Gothland. Uh, and some clever things have been done. You've got the old goods shed there. Well, of course, we don't get goods trains today on the, uh, on the Heritage Railway. Uh, so the goods shed's been turned into a, into a cafe, uh, and people actually sit in the wagons to have their sandwiches. And sometimes I wonder whether they realise what they're sitting in. One of the things that was introduced in the 1930s by the London and North Eastern Railway, who'd become the owners of the line in the 1920s, were camping coaches, which was a novel idea that people could come by train to have a holiday and then uh, the railway would provide them with somewhere to stay in the form of old coaches that were done up with uh, sleeping accommodation and this sort of thing. And we've recreated that, and they're very, very popular. I'd like to say that they're, they're much better equipped than the old LNER ones were, to be honest. You had to go outside and go and uh, uh, persuade the station master to give you your water. Uh, we have got, we've got pipe to running water and heating as well, so they're very, a very pleasant accommodation today. But it does take us back to something that was happening 50, 60 years ago. First-time visitors to Gilfland Station may find it strangely familiar, because it's something of a TV star. For television's Heartbeat series, it becomes the fictional Aidensfield station. A similar transformation affects many of the businesses in Gofland Village, a short walk up the hill. It's also starred in the movies. Uh, so Harry Potter station was Hogsmeade uh, when uh, he got off the train coming from King's Cross. And uh, clearly that makes the station very popular and we still get people coming along and saying, where's Harry Potter station? As trains leave Gothland Station, they head into even more remote moorland countryside. In the 60s, passengers looked up into the hills to see three giant golf balls. In fact, they were domes that covered radars, part of a Cold War defence system designed to give Britain and America four minutes warning in the event of a nuclear attack. Today, they've been replaced by a top-secret pyramid. We now have this rather unusual triangular-shaped building, which people call the sandcastle, but it performs the same function as the old golf balls, but it does it much more efficiently. Uh, so it's still very important to, uh, in this part of the world, but a, a huge change, a huge difference between that technology and that of the steam trains down in the valley. The railway twists and turns through valleys and gorges formed by the Ice Age, and eventually winds its way into Levisham Station. A halt that's well over a mile from the remote moorland community it supposedly serves. You can envisage perhaps some young teenage girl in the 19th century. Uh, she's going away, I don't know, she's having her first job. Maybe she's going into service and she arrives at Levisham Station, last train at night, maybe about 8.30 in the evening. It's getting dark and it's windy and it's rainy. And she says to the porter, well, where's the village? And he tells her that it's a mile and a half away and about 300 feet higher. Eventually, the steam trains haul their restored carriages into Pickering Station. Today, this once lost railway carries over 300,000 passengers a year. It makes a valuable contribution to the moorland economy and in keeping many cars off the roads of the National Park, a significant contribution to the environment too. Eventually, the Whitby to Pickering line linked up with lots of other fledgling railways and an embryonic rail network was formed. But this is the end of the restored line. 
The tracks that went beyond this have been lost, a victim of Dr. Beeching's axe in the 1960s. One of the most valuable lost connections was to York, which in the early days of the railways was a hugely important railway city. York is a historic jewel. Its minster, the largest Gothic cathedral in Europe, looks down on a city full of Roman and Viking remains. Its medieval walls enclose a World Heritage Site where protection and preservation are the orders of the day. The tourists strolling along the walls often miss important clues to the city's early railway history because they walk right over the top of them. There are these huge arches, holes cut into the precious medieval masonry to give trains access to the city's original station. The walls had repelled invaders for centuries, but were breached by the railway companies that were becoming a powerful force in the land. In the 1830s, they were suspicious of railways. Um, they thought that cows would stop giving milk and babies would be stillborn and all the rest of it by these horrible trains tearing around the countryside. But of course, all this opposition gradually disappeared when they found out how profitable some of the rail early railways were becoming, paying 10% dividends on the London and Birmingham, things like that. So by the 1840s, everybody wanted railways and it was a god. You know, it, it was welcomed everywhere. To build a railway station within the city walls was probably quite a bold thing to do in those days. It may have been elegant, but it soon became impractical. It wasn't a through station. Trains had to reverse out of it. As the railways became busier, it became a bottleneck and a byword for chaos. Only six years after it opened, the Times described it as ill-planned, worse managed and far too small for the traffic. It was eventually replaced by York's current station in 1877. Today, the old terminal survives as offices and there are still traces of its original platforms and even some track. It's difficult to imagine how quickly the railway system developed through the 1840s and 50s. Everybody wanted a railway to their village or town. Small companies sprung up everywhere before merging into bigger corporations. The North Eastern Railway was the biggest railway company in the world when it was formed through amalgamations in York in 1854. The NER's prosperity was built on coal and other minerals. Its network of lines is depicted on a ceramic tile map in York's present day station. Many North East docks are included because it owned those too. At one stage, 2,000 rail trucks a day carried coal into Tyne Dock where it was loaded onto ships. It always carried more freight than it did passengers. Its revenue from freight was a lot more than from passengers. There was certain things that it didn't really like to carry, like livestock because, you know, they were messy, awkward to transport, and they had to be transported relatively quickly. And if they kicked each other, there was claims, and the whole thing was, was not very good. But they, they, they were common carriers of everything you could possibly think of. They even had excrement wagons um, for unloading the earth closets on stations into. This powerful railway company also built hotels, like the Royal Station in York, much to the consternation of the city's smaller hotel owners. The best description I've heard was it was a benevolent monopoly. When the iron and steel industry was going through a bad spell, they actually reduced the rates for carrying the materials to and from the steelworks. So it, it worked very, very well. I, I don't think anybody uh, who lived in the area was badly served by them. In 1877, the NER opened what was then the biggest station in the country, the one that still serves York today. It's a colossal structure, taking up a huge tract of land outside the city walls. The curved, glazed roof is over 800 feet long and 230 feet wide. It's supported on iron columns with the NER's coat of arms proudly cast into the spandrels. At the time, writers referred to it as a cathedral of iron and glass to rival York's cathedral of stone. 
The vast curved train shed, which is so magnificent, was designed, of course, by the engineer Thomas Elliot Harrison. It's probably one of the finest train sheds in Britain. And, of course, it's on a curve because it's quite a difficult site because you've got to get the main line from the south to curve around to follow the river to go north. The fact that the railway did come to York, I mean, there's this story that George Hudson said, Mackot Railways come to York. Um, at one time, between the hour of nine and ten o'clock, you can get a train virtually to anywhere in the country, from Cornwall to Aberdeen, Inverness, and uh, anywhere else you wanted to go. The NER kept on growing, absorbing more and more companies, including the Stockton and Darlington, and even building new branch lines which held little prospect of making money. The government expected a rich and powerful railway company to serve their less populated communities. But the truth was the NER could afford it, and its huge wealth, power and importance was expressed in new headquarters in York, completed in 1906. It was built in a mix of architectural styles with Dutch gables and balconies with Queen Anne embellishments. The NER's coat of arms is prominent on its facade. It's only recently that this magnificent building's connection with railway companies has been lost. It reopened recently as a luxury hotel. If the NER was the epitome of a big and powerful railway company, a narrow gauge railway about seven miles east of York was the opposite end of the scale. In the village of Sand Hutton, there are traces of a Saxon church dating back to the 12th century. But evidence of an extraordinarily lost railway that originally ran for a mile and a half through the village and the surrounding countryside in the early 20th century is harder to find. The Sand Hutton Light Railway started off in 1914 as a garden railway, a toy for the fourth baronet of Sand Hutton, Sir Robert Walker. It ran for about a mile and a half altogether, but it was mainly used for pleasure, for entertaining guests and local children and local groups of worthies would come to visit. There was also an added incentive that children were allowed to ride on the railway on a Sunday if they'd been to Sunday school. So of course that increased the numbers to the Sunday school attendance quite dramatically. They had a, a rather nice engine built specially for the railway. Behind that, they used to pull some little open carriages for people to sit in. Uh, we, we do still have some photographs of the people riding across the hall grounds in the little open carriages. Obviously quite a wonderful experience because the setting was absolutely idyllic. I think it's nice to be able to picture the scene of the little railway running through the, the estate. I mean, some the estate would have been absolutely beautiful in those days lined with rhododendrons and, and absolutely beautifully manicured. Uh, the, the guy had pots of money. He was reputed to be the, the wealthiest man in the British Army during the First World War. So in those days, for him, presumably, money was no object. So to invite his friends to come and ride on his railway must have been a, a wonderful thing. But Sir Robert, who was in the Coldstream Guards, was called out to New Zealand during the First World War. He took his trusty servant, George Batty, with him to be his driver. But once the war was over, Sir Robert returned to Sand Hutton, determined to turn his toy railway into something more useful for the community. He had some pretty good reasons to develop what had been the Garden Railway to a proper light railway. It would be useful, obviously, to be able to carry goods from the connection with the main line railway at Warthill to all the farms on the estate. There would have been a certain amount of passenger traffic as well, because bearing in mind uh, around the time of the First World War, motor traffic was indifferent, really. So the links from even Sand Hutton to York, which is not far these days, was quite a difficult journey in those days. He purchased four Hunslets eventually from the meat factory and brought them up to Sand Hutton. He used those for the hauling of the little wagons. He bought, I think, something about 60 or 70 little four-wheel wagons to run on the railway as well and had a, a coach built for passenger transport. Quite a big coach with a little place of serving teas in one end, rather a genteel way to travel. Although the passenger transport really amounted just to market days, which was Wednesdays and Saturdays. So mostly the traffic was farm traffic, goods going out from the farms and coal and 
animal feeds coming into the farm. The light railway, which had a gauge of 18 inches, ran for seven and a half miles around the estate. It was kept busy by the brickworks at Claxton, carrying bricks to a connection with the North Eastern Railway's main line. But the closure of the brickworks in 1929, the decline of agriculture in the area, and early death of Sir Robert at the age of 40, saw the miniature railway close in 1932. These days, only tiny reminders of Sir Robert's home and railway survive. Sand Hutton Hall was demolished. These are the steps to its ballroom, now in a private garden, where you can also see traces of where the railway tracks ran close to the hall. On the outskirts of the village, there's a miniature railway embankment that can just be made out, and along the route of the old track, concrete pillars to a railway bridge over a beck, which was known locally as the Fourth Bridge. A little bit remains of the garden railway, where it crossed one corner of the lake. You can still see the remains of the little bridge that crossed that. The rails are no longer there, or rather the original rails are no longer there. There are still some rails there which supported the bridge but uh, of the Garden Railway, virtually nothing at all. While the remnants of this tiny railway on the outskirts of York are hard to find, there's no shortage of evidence in the city that it very quickly became a railway stronghold, a northern hub in Britain's rapidly developing network. But of course, the boom in railways wasn't restricted to the region that had invented them. London and the South soon caught on with some very different types of railways and an intensity of railway building that was to create railway mania. <laughs>